Wonderful. Okay, again, welcome. So Christina, if you wanted to share your screen, um, a few uh, things I, I wanted to mention, if this is your first Zoom webinar, then it is a little, little bit different than a regular Zoom call. So um, there is a question and answer feature. It should be at the bottom of your screen. So if you have a question, feel free to do that. And there's also polls. So there'll be a few questions we'll ask that you can respond to as, uh, as we go through. So again, welcome, lovely to see everyone. And um, this is Vintage Fitness. My name is Erin, I'm the owner of Vintage Fitness and we have Christina from Thrive Nutrition. Um, we're gonna talk for about 45 minutes today all about um, pain. So again, if you haven't, aren't, aren't familiar with Vintage Fitness, we, are, we only work with older adults who are really quite specialized. Um, clients do achieve their health goals with us and we have a lots of vintage clients on the, on the call, which is great. Um, it's slow and steady. So this is our team of personal trainers and we have a team of 12 personal trainers that are all um, senior fitness specialists. Um, it's not building the bikini body necessarily and it's not um, the 90 day transformation. It's making the right decisions, nutrition being a big part of that. And over time you get that positive results. Uh, and we've been doing this for a while. So I started this company in 2005 when I was pregnant with my second daughter and she is turning 16 next month. So it's crazy town. It's good. We've, been, we've been at this for a while. So today's session, we're really gonna talk through the link between diet and joint pain and the, the intermediary there, which Christina will talk about is inflammation. So it's about keeping inflammation down in the body and what you eat has a huge impact on how inflamed your body is and links to pain. Um, Christina, why don't you continue on here? Cause you're, you're- Okay, perfect. Well, hello, good morning, everybody. My name is Christina Tahosis. I'm a holistic nutritionist and owner of Thrive Nutrition Practice. I help people use nutrition to sleep better, to create energy, and to support issues such as, you know, if you have high blood pressure or um, type 2 diabetes, or your blood sugar is a bit high, or you have high cholesterol or insulin resistance. And I love to help people lose their belly fat because the belly fat is a high source of inflammation. So uh, that's what I specialize in. I'm delighted to be here today. So thank you very much, Erin, for inviting me to speak to this wonderful community of people on a topic that um, is really, really important. And that is the connection between what we eat and the possible symptoms of pain that we can be experiencing. And the word pain, it kind of covers a, a broad spectrum of symptoms, right? Um, it covers headaches and muscle aches and stomach aches and joint pain, just to, to name but a few. Um, but I'd really like to zone in on the, um, the particular issue of joint pain today, uh, just to use it as an example and a point of departure for our conversation, because the reasons for why food can cause joint related pain can be applied to other symptoms of pain as well. And that is because pain, no matter where we experience it, is a symptom of inflammation occurring somewhere in the body. And the food we eat can either act to either nourish your body and keep inflammation at bay, or it can act to sabotage our body and fuel the fire of inflammation. Now, let's start our little journey into the link between uh, nutrition and pain with a really, really super easy question. Okay, ready, Erin, with our question to the, to, to the people here who are watching. There are two pictures of food here that show our body lots of love and keep inflammation at bay. And then there are two pictures of food here that sabotage our body and fuel by the fire of inflammation. Which ones are the love foods? Those foods that keep inflammation at bay. You can have more than one. So why don't you just have a little vote on that multiple choice question and we'll see what the, what the results are when, when you're ready.
Sure, right. we, we, we have a vote. Yeah, we're there. Most people have voted. I'll just wait for another couple of uh, seconds. Yeah, well, good, uh, good participation here, gang. Okay, yeah. so we're pretty. It's a good question to, to kick things off. So, yeah. So there are two pictures. Okay, so fruit one, next stir fry. Exactly. So fruit in the stir fry got the winning votes. And that is exactly right, right? That was a super, super easy question to kick things off. And the reason why it's so easy to identify love foods or those foods that, that nourish the body and lower inflammation is because it's just instinctive. You know, you look at those foods, they're full of color, they're full of vibrancy, they're just, you know, made by mother nature, and you know that they're going to be good for you. Our body really instinctively reacts and knows what foods are packed with nutrients like vitamin C and B vitamins and minerals and other vitamins that are going to be there to help us create energy and help us sleep and help us to do the things that really make us feel alive. Um, and so love foods are what I call empowering foods, okay? And I generally break them down into the following categories, okay? So these love and nutrient-dense foods, first category is fruits and vegetables, all fruits and all vegetables, all colors of the rainbow, um, healthy fats, and I've given you some examples there as well. These are really important to keep the whole body um, lubricated and um, to regulate our hormones, to lower inflammation in the body. The other love food is, is animal or plant-based proteins. And if you're choosing to go for animal proteins, I'm always encouraging people to, to go for the grass-fed and the organic so that you don't have the antibiotics and the added hormones and the added toxins, which just get harder and harder to detoxify as we age. Um, and then there are the carbohydrates, but not just any carbohydrates. I'm really looking for those nutrient dense carbohydrates that are really packed with um, vitamin A specifically. And I just wanted to highlight that uh, like foods like pumpkin, sweet potato, butternut squash, yams, all those sort of orange based um, carbohydrates that are just super rich in vitamin A, which is so important for immunity. And immunity is top of mind today, uh, of course, with, with COVID looming over us um, and the need to kind of stay physically uh, strong and, uh, and immune. So all of these love foods, what I call love foods, contribute to energy. They help do things like build the neurotransmitters we need for sleep. They support your gut health, which is really important. They feed the good bacteria in your gut. And the reason why that's super important is because gut health is the, the I, I call it like the motherboard for all of our immunity and even for our mental health, because so much of our serotonin, as you might have heard from other speakers um, here in the vintage uh, fitness webinars, our serotonin, our mental health, happy hormone is made in our gut. So that's really important. These love foods also help to regulate our blood sugar, balance our hormones, um, and of course, strengthen immunity and mental health. So these are the foods that are really nourishing and improve our quality of life and help to do things like reduce pain. Okay. So Christina, I, I, uh, I'll yeah. just jump in here because one of the things I find really interesting is I've looked mm -hmm. at some research that says you're, in terms of your gut, if you tend to have a quite a high sugar diet, the type yeah. of microbes that you have in your gut can actually send signals to your brain to crave sugar more. So as you change your eating habits and you change the flora of your gut, it's almost like your gut leading your mind, which is incredible. You can, your, your cravings will adjust. And one of the reasons they'll adjust is because your microbial environment in your gut has, is changing. So it's pretty, I found that amazing. It's, it is amazing. Um, you know, one of the, one of the little group coaching programs that I'm doing now is uh, I, the, I killed my sugar beast, um, <laughs> group coaching program. And I developed this because, uh, breaking my own sugar addiction was, uh, something that was just 
fundamental to changing, really revolutionizing my own health and wellness and helping me achieve my, my, my weight goals, my health goals, my sleep goals, everything. And, um, you know, at the time when I was struggling to break this sugar addiction, I don't know if how many people can relate to this on the, uh, on the webinar today, but I was really beating myself up because I felt really weak minded, you know, it was like, why can't I just ignore the little voice in my head that's, you know, that's pushing me towards the pantry to get that chocolate or to get that biscuit? You know, why am I so weak minded? And what I've come to realize and what I realized over, you know, the, the course of you know, studying nutrition and helping people is that actually the sugar beast doesn't live in your mind. It lives in your gut. And really the microbes in our gut fuel our sugar cravings. They fuel the cravings that we have. And really, if we start taking um, little steps day by day to change our food habits and to change that bacteria, the bacterial composition in our gut, we can really uh, find that you know we're able to control our cravings a lot more and be in control of our own food choices. So I'm really glad that you mentioned that because that's a really um, powerful example of how you know sometimes it's the gut controlling the the mind and not the other way around. Um, okay, so let's have a look now at sabotage foods and what those might be within the context of inflammation and pain. So sabotage foods are what I call nutrient poor foods. So foods that are really just not contributing to your energy levels or your overall health and wellness. You know, examples of that are highly processed foods. So this is what I call like the dead food that you find in the aisles of the supermarket. So stuff that comes in a box like biscuits and crackers and, um, you know, highly processed breakfast cereals. Those are, I've got a war on breakfast cereal, I tell you. Um, processed oils. So all of that um, highly processed canola and soy and peanut, peanut oil, those are terrible. Foods high in refined sugar, so like um, packaged baked goods, ice cream, this kind of thing. And foods that are really high in carbohydrates, for example, what pasta, potato, and bread could be, but really to the extent that they're crowding out the rightful place of these love foods on your plate. You know, quite often, you know, when we're having like pasta, that's the mainstay of our meal. But, you know, what I uh, encourage people to do is, you know, absolutely inclu include these carbohydrates, but are they the ones that are really supporting your health and wellness goals? And if they're not, you know, try to make room for those love foods like the vegetables, um, like the high quality proteins and the high and the high quality healthy fats that are really going to empower you a lot more than um, than a plate based uh, a plate full of carbohydrates. So foods that are nutrient poor, they inhibit efficient digestion and the efficient absorption of rich foods and they crowd out these love and living foods. And as a result, they contribute to inflammation and they contribute to poor gut health, okay? Um, and what I like to tell people is that really, there are only so many bites that we can take in a day, right? There's only so much food that we can eat. And it's not as if we can spend the whole day eating, right? Um, so if we're really, if we really just have this like finite number of bites that we take um, during the day, what I try to encourage people to use is to to do is to use those finite number of bites to prioritize the the love rich foods, those foods that are really nutrient rich and that are going to help you lower inflammation in the body, so that actually you crowd out the opportunity to eat the foods that are these saboteur foods and that are going to, are going to contribute to inflammation in the body. Um, and that might sound kind of obvious, but it's a really important point of awareness because many of us, when we think about using food to, to reach our health and wellness goals, you know, like decreasing pain or losing weight or, you know, any health and wellness goal that we might think, we're really programmed into thinking, okay, which foods do I take away, right? And because you instinctively know that 
you know, croissants and sugar and these highly processed foods are, are, are bad for you, you aim to take those foods away, right? So that's the first thing I got certainly, you know, 12 years ago when I was working on um, really changing my dietary habits uh, in a positive way, you know, that's the first thing that I did. I was like, okay, I quit sugar. I'm going to, you know, just step away from the sugar and I'm going to, uh, that's what I'm going to do. But just because you're taking away these sabotage foods, just because you're quitting sugar, just because you're taking away foods, it doesn't mean that you're actually prioritizing the foods that are going to help you. It doesn't mean that you're getting enough of those love nutrient rich foods. Um, and because generally, if we're pouring a lot of our energy into avoiding bad food or so-called bad food, that generally means that we're not dedicating enough energy and enough mental space to prioritizing the love foods. So my advice to you is if you're looking to reduce pain or if you're looking to achieve any health and wellness goal this year as we enter into 2021, is to really make, make sure that you're dedicating those finite number of bites to the nourishing foods. You're really making a priority to, to choose the love foods um, because the more bites you take of the love foods, the less opportunity there is to introduce the sabotage foods into your day. And what's more is, you know, if you do go for a biscuit or a cracker, if you have used those bites to prioritize those love foods, it means that you've given your body so many more nutrients, so many more antioxidants, so many of those foods um, that are rich in the nutrients that you need to actually detoxify and metabolize the sugar or the other toxins that uh, you've, you're introducing. So really um, making sure that you prioritize the love foods is a really powerful way of mitigating the effect um, and the negative effects that eating these um, pr highly processed foods or sugar rich foods can have. Um, so that's a really sort of important um, little tip that I wanted to include for you today. Erin, how are we doing? Are there any questions at this stage? Nope, no questions. No? Okay, okay. So now here's where it gets a little tricky. Sometimes there are love foods, but when we eat them, they behave like sabotage foods in the body. Can anybody relate to that? Where they have something that they think is like really healthy and suddenly it causes them pain or digestive discomfort or they feel bloating or you know it triggers a migraine or something like that. Yeah, this is, this is where the, the whole issue of nutrition gets sometimes a little tricky and joint pain is a really good example of where this gets tricky. Um, especially if you suffer from joint pain, there are a lot of masquerading foods out there that belong to the lectin family of foods. And these can include things like beans, which are normally, you know, these are 100% percent love foods. They're rich in fiber. They're rich in protein, rich in everything that's supposed to make you feel good. But sometimes we eat these foods and they can cause a lot of discomfort. Dairy is another one of those. Wheat germ is another one of these uh, uh, lectin rich foods. And then there are the foods like peppers and eggplant, tomatoes and potatoes, which are part of the nightshade family. And these can um, certainly cause a lot of joint pain in people if it's a main part of their meal uh, at every meal of the day and, and, and uh, throughout the day. So this collection of foods, they, generally it can be, you know, part of a healthy balanced diet, but they have this protein called lectin, which is resistant to human digestion. And as a result, it enters the bloodstream unchanged. Okay. So why or how do these lectins cause pain? Let's have a look. Okay, so on the one hand, as we age, we can't digest as well as we used to. Our digestive fire decreases. Erin, um, let's take a little poll here. 
how many of you feel that it's harder to digest your meals now than it was when you were in your 30s? especially things like steak. Let's do a little poll. Has digestion gotten harder for you than when you were younger? The results are coming in now. Most, well, most people have voted. So mm -hmm. let me... Let me wait for another sort of 15 seconds or so in case people are deliberating. Right. Yeah, a lot of people um, feel that way. So we've got 58% of people who voted who say it has gotten harder um, and 42% who say it hasn't. A lot of people feel that as they age, um, it, digesting their meals gets harder and harder, especially animal protein. Animal protein is one of those things that becomes harder and harder for people to digest. And what I mean by digestive fire in particular is, is that we kind of lose, um, as we age, we, we, the, our digestive juices, including the hydrochloric acid that our stomach produces to break down our protein, um, we just don't make enough we, we don't make as much as we did when we were in our 20s and 30s, um, particularly after the age of 45 or so. And so as a result, when we eat meals, we might experience thing, pain, uh, bloating, we might experience digestive discomfort or stomach um, or acid reflux. Um, we might experience symptoms like this. And unfortunately, if over the course of our life, we've been eating a diet that's perhaps leaning heavily towards these sabotage foods like sweets and croissants and breads and biscuits and, and having these carbohydrates, for example, be the mainstay of our meals instead of prioritizing the nutrient rich love foods. Um, if we've dedicated most of the room on our plate to carb rich ingredients, um, these, these grains and these carb-rich ingredients also break down into, into the body as sugar, creating inflammation. Um, Christina, so I just a question's come up that um, I wanted to ask you, which is li linked to lectins, uh, have some people developed some sort of allergy to them? Is, is it, where does allergy um, play in here? Mm, I would say um, uh, maybe not so much allergy, but intolerance. And so if you think about the reason why anyone has uh, problems digesting certain foods, it's because, again, going back to your gut health, it's because there isn't enough of that particular bacteria um, in your gut to be able to break down um, that particular food and absorb it uh, properly into the body. And so if, if anyone has um, sort of gut gut imbalances, that's when we experience intolerances to thing to to foods um, and to foods with with lectin in it. So we need a really di sort of robust um, gut health and microbial environment in our gut in order to be able to efficiently and effectively digest and absorb our meals. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. So should we avoid these lectin foods if we find I am getting there? to that. Oh, okay. I'm getting to that. <laughs> I am totally getting to that. Um, so, okay. So where were we? So these sort of foods, again, traditionally part of a healthy diet, but sometimes if our gut, uh, if our gut flora is imbalanced, um, we can't digest these, these things properly. And so when we can't digest things properly, that in and of itself manifests itself in pain. And common examples of pain can be something like, you know, if we have trouble passing gas, that causes a lot of pain in our abdomen, in our, in our abdomen and can sometimes feel like we have a tightness in the chest that can be really uncomfortable. If what we're eating impairs digestion, um, then our colon can get irritated. 
and that can radiate pain up and down our legs and on our back sometimes, or it can manifest itself in painful hemorrhoids. That's another really common um, source of, or type of pain. If we're having trouble uh, digesting the fats in our foods, then, you know, like if we're kind of pairing these foods with like, you know, heavy, heavy fat foods like chips or french fries or, you know, heavy cheeses or something like that, then this can cause um, pain in the form of like gallbladder sludge or stones, which can radiate up to our shoulder blades. Um, we can also get headaches or migraines um, if, if we're not able to digest these foods. So poor digestion can definitely lead to discomfort and pain on many different levels. Okay. And unfortunately, if our gut health isn't optimal, then when we eat these foods, which are high in lectins, then they can cause a whole load of digestive distress. And the reason um, for that is because these lectin proteins, they're kind of sticky and they're prone to attaching themselves to our intestinal wall. And when that happens, then we don't get a digestive system that works like clockwork. Instead, it starts to slow down. We become less efficient at absorbing the nutrients that we do get from our food. Um, and that's not good because at the end of the day, we're really, we're not really what we eat. We're what our, what our body is able to absorb. So we need to have a good digestive system in order to absorb the nutrients that then help us achieve our health and wellness goals. Um, and to top it all off, there's another way these little pectin, these little pesky uh, lectins can cause pain. As it turns out, these proteins um, are also very similar to the proteins used in our joint spaces and our body can confuse the two. So these sticky proteins then make our way, make their way into our joint spaces and suddenly we start in um, having joint pain. So either way, um, they contribute to um, to pain. And with respect to joint pain, these particular foods can contribute to thing to pain like rheumatoid arthritis, which is more of an autoimmune condition. Okay. Now, on to your question, Erin, do we eliminate or reduce or what do we do? Okay. And um, I mean, you know, sometimes when you listen to a nutritionist, <laughs> I get this a lot. I'm I hear like, geez, you know, what can I possibly eat? And like, do I have to take these foods out of my diet? And I'm just never going to be able to get this right. You know, you nutritionists, you take all the fun away from eating. <laughs> um, so let me let let me um, let me tell you a little secret. OK, I actually don't believe in giving anything up. I believe in trading up. Okay. And there's a really, that's a really, really important distinction. Now, I know you're all familiar with the concept of trading up because you've been using this concept all your life. Okay. Is this the best car I can drive? Is this the best smartphone I can have? The is this the best iPad I can be using? The best house I can own? Is this the best education I can give my kids? We are all used to employing the trade of concept in other aspects of our life, but we're not as used to employing this concept when it comes to food, okay? And the question that I encourage all of you to, to use in your daily practice when you're preparing your meals and when you're making your food choices is, is this the best possible choice I can be making for myself right here, right now? Okay, because if all we do is focus on eliminating, how does that make us feel at the end of the day, right? It feels, to me, it feels like I'm punishing myself, you know, and like I'm denying myself the freedom and the spontaneity of eating anything that I want. Okay, and it's kind of like human nature to to want to be um, spontaneous and to have um, choice. And if we take that away from ourselves, if we take that away from our uh, sort of mental approach to food, then it's just not sustainable. Okay, that's why diets fail, in my opinion, because they they um, they program us to want that so-called treat meal. You know, they 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 
they program us to um, to focus on taking things away, but not putting things in. Um, but what if we were to reframe our thinking on this? What if we were to reframe our thinking about nutrition in order to promote positive behavior that we could actually stick to? And um, that's where I think that the concept of trading up is really valuable because that really empowers us. That makes us feel like we're making choices that are good for us and that show our body the love and kindness and respect that it deserves. So um, I find this a really powerful concept that I've employed for myself and that I use in clinical practice. And it really helps people just um, practice mindful awareness about what they're eating and make uh, right choices at each step of the way, because, you know, change doesn't happen overnight and we can't let perfect be the enemy of good when we're dealing with nutrition. We just have to try to make the right choices one, you know, one day at a time, one meal at a time, one choice at a time. Uh, and I find that the concept of trading up can be really powerful in helping you steer uh, towards those love nutrient dense foods and um, crowd out again, the opportunity for the saboteur foods to come into the diet. Okay, so within using this concept of like not wanting to eliminate, but really just trying to promote positive behavior and trading up, what can we do? Okay, so the first thing we can do is we can try to reduce the lectins in these lectin foods so that the lectins don't overpower us. And these are some of the ways that you can do that, okay? You can peel your potatoes, tomatoes, um, peppers. You can peel the foods that um, have are high in lectins and take away the seeds. Um, and the second one is a little bit controversial, but uh, you can choose white over brown rice grains, for example, because it's the shell of the grain, it's the shell of the rice that is high in lectin. So sometimes having white rice isn't bad if you really find that um, rice upsets you during the digestive process. We can try also to sprout the, the beans, grains, and seeds, and there's loads of YouTube videos out there that can teach you how to do that. Um, we can eat these foods in their fermented form. When they're fermented, we break down all of the um, proteins and all of the um, you know bits in the in the in these foods that are really hard to digest, so that it doesn't take our body. It do, we don't our body doesn't need to work as hard to digest it. Um, we can also soak the beans, the grains, and the seeds for at least twelve hours. I usually just you know, if I'm making something like that, I put it in a, a big bowl and I let it sit overnight with lots of water. And you can also then pressure cook. And I love my instant pot. If you don't have an instant pot, it's God's gift to <laughs> quick cooking <laughs> and healthy cooking. I love it. Um, and that, that also really helps to reduce the lectins and lectin yeah. foods. Christina, a question that has come up, are crock pots just as good as Instapots? Oh, that is a good question. Now, a crock pot is a slow, it's a slow cooker, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, um, I might have to get back to you on that, actually. Okay. Um, only because um, whilst the crock pot uh, is fantastic at giving those like melting your mouth, the melting your mouth consistency, I'm just wondering if there's something about the pressure and the heat in the instant pot that um, is what um, breaks down the, the lectins. So I might just uh, have to research that a little bit and get back okay. to you. No problem. Um, okay. Now, where are we? Okay. So that's uh, one bit that we can do to reduce lectins. The other thing um, that I find even uh, more sustainable and better from a, from a long-term perspective is really helping people to improve their digestive fire. So really helping uh, people to improve their gut health. And um, these are the seven points that I employ in, in clinical practice to really just sort of as a base um, to help people do that. And I'd love to go through with them with you now and tell you the reasons why I've included these points in terms of like helping people improve their, their gut health and improving people be more efficient digesters. 
The first is to drink half your body weight. So you take your body weight in pounds, you divide it by two, and that's how much water you have to drink over the course of the day in ounces. And the reason why that is important, um, apart from the fact that, you know, water helps to lubricate the gut and it helps us become really efficient detoxifiers, um, it can also help like for anyone, um, you know, who, um, you know, bleeds, uh, for example, if they have a bowel movement or if they have painful bowel movements, one of the top reasons for dehydration and uh, blood in the stools is dehydration. So this is a really, really important point. But the other thing that it helps us do is it helps us produce stomach acid in our stomach in order to break down those proteins. So it's really important to focus on drinking enough water not just from a detoxification perspective, but from an, from, you know, right from the beginning, when you um, start to eat, it's really important to have a good quality hydrochloric acid in the stomach so that you can break down your proteins. And this is the first thing that helps. The other thing that I like Sorry, to- Sorry, Christina, while you're on that point, cause I, I know my clients and I know what question is sitting in their brains. Yeah, um, okay. Is yeah. it okay if it's in the first half of the day, so you're not up multiple times in the night having to go pee? Mm, yeah, actually, um, so uh, what, oh, so, okay, so what do you call the first half of the day? Like up to 3 p.m. or? Sh sure, yeah, up to 3 p.m. Yeah. Just so, so that you're not, you know, having to get, if you're drinking that much water, I know people aren't sure. going to want to get up four times a night to go pee. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, it, so definitely, um, it, it doesn't matter so much when you drink it. Although, um, I would say that, you know, probably like four o'clock, five o'clock is a good cutoff point, um, in order to stop drinking water. If your concern is that you're getting up in the middle of the night to have to go pee, um, but it is really important, especially first thing in the morning, because we actually wake up dehydrated. We actually lose a lot of moisture during sleep. Um, so a lot of people get up in the morning and have a coffee, where, whereas, you know, in the morning, the first thing that we need is to just glug down a whole bunch of water just to just to rehydrate the body and get it back to uh, balance in terms of what it needs from a from a water you know, point of view. So certainly um, if, you know, first thing that first, if the first thing you do in the morning is to have like, you know, two glasses of water, two to three glasses of water to just rehydrate the body, make sure that you're replenishing it with the water that it has been lost over the course of the night, then that's a really good job done. Okay. We've had two more water questions. One is mm. water only doesn't include coffee, juice, et cetera. Correct. 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 Okay. And the other one is um, from Leslie, does it matter hot, cold or hot slash warm? Oh, that's a really good question. Thanks for uh, asking that. So um, I'll tell you what I, I lived for in Hong Kong for 13 years, and I became a massive fan of warm water or even hot water. And the reason for that is because your body takes it in. Um, and it's and then it takes it in a lot more easily. And it, it's a it's better for rehydration and hydration purposes. Um, when you drink ice cold water, so, um, so one of the things that I did this summer is I went up to Muskoka and it was the first time in a long time. And I jumped into the lake and you can just imagine how my body reacted, right? It went like this. <laughs> and that's exactly what your insides do when you feed it cold, ice cold water. It actually stops your digestive fire. So, or quells it, right? Like if you think of our, um, of our body or of our, our, our digestive organs wanting to be this like furnace that's really gonna um, do a great job at digesting your food, you really wanna keep that fire strong. So giving it cold water is a no-no in my, in my books. So yeah, warm room temperature works really well. Anything else? We good? Yes, we're good. Perfect. Okay, so the second um, thing that I like to advise is to not eat between the meals. And the reason for that in terms of improving digestive fire is because um, our body really needs time to, um, to rest and digest. So it needs time 
to finish digesting the food that you've given it at your mealtime. And it needs then time to dedicate to detoxifying and it needs time to rebuild your digestive juices and to rebuild your hydrochloric acid and to rebuild on um, the, the digestive fire and the, and, the, and the digestive process. So if you're constantly eating between meals, you're really not giving your body enough time to, um, to rebuild all of the digestive juices that it needs to, to, so that the next time you eat, you can have a really efficient digestive process. Number three, um, and this is, you've probably heard this a million times, but chew your food carefully and mindfully. Digestion starts, um, it starts with uh, the energy, you know, with which we're accepting our food. It starts with being uh, grateful and excited uh, about what we're eating. And it starts with our mouth starts with, to be honest, actually, it starts with like smelling the food and being aware of what you're eating and really getting that saliva going. And then, um, you know, the first thing that we do is we put it into our mouth with gratitude and we start chewing. And if we spend a lot of time chewing here, then our stomach has less work to do. So chewing your food is a really, really important part of uh, the a digestive, of a strong uh, digestive process. And then here are a few things that, um, you know, I, I also like to, to include in clinical practice and I found have been very successful, particularly within the context of improving gut health and, um, and just lowering inflammation in the body. Um, I like, I'm a one protein per person, per meal uh, kind of person. Um, and I, I, I think that's really important uh, in order not to sort of overload the body and create a lot of acidity in the body. So just choose one meal per, one protein per meal and vary that protein. You know, so if you're having eggs in the morning, you can have chicken in the afternoon and some salmon in the evening, for example. Just make sure you get that protein variety in. And similarly with your plant-based foods, so your fruits and vegetables. For me, four is the magic number. And it's the magic number for me because this, this is what the data suggests and what the research suggests is, uh, is important for optimal gut health. Um, you know, a, a lot of, uh, there's been obviously a lot of people uh, now take probiotics um, and uh, probiotics are super, um, but the, the thing is that we need variety in the diet in order to really make a transformative change in the gut. And so having variety in the diet by um, varying the amount of plant-based foods that we eat with our meal is really important. And so really when we're, when we're doing four plant-based foods with each meal, we're going to look later what that actually can look like in a meal. Um, we're really giving our gut bacteria the, the varied fiber and nutrients it needs to promote a healthy gut microbiome. Um, and then the last two just have to do with, again, uh, getting enough rest and sleep. I like to leave 12 hours between dinner and breakfast the next day, and I encourage everybody to sleep eight hours a night. This is really, really important for digestion, um, for, you know, for any health and wellness goals. So, um, so yeah, those are, those are my seven, my seven tips that I, I give all my clients uh, for, for optimal gut health and to improve their digestive fire so that uh, we aim to lower inflammation in the body and reduce pain. Um, so Christina, a question came up a while ago um, and it was about um, one of the, Wanda was saying that citrus fruits, mm. she feels like it upsets like limes and lemons. She feels mm. like sometimes can upset her digestion. Is that, um, is that when she has it on an empty stomach or just in general? Do we know? Maybe Wanda, you can uh, answer that in the chat. Um, oh, right. In general. In general. Um, that's interesting. Um, I mean, you know, different people have different foods that they react to. 
Um, and again, it, it's, it's about, I mean, sometimes it's about, uh, first of all, understanding what they are and um, maybe taking them away for a time to, and working on the gut health piece to see if we can slowly reintroduce them again. Um, because sometimes it's, it's sometimes a whole orange, for example, can be problematic, um, but maybe not one slice. So it's about kind of like rebuilding the gut flora so that we can have a robust um, system of microbiome, uh, a robust microbiome so that we can eventually um, start introducing and incorporating these foods back into the diet. And then the citrus fruits, um, the, uh, is it about, does it, do they link to inflammation in the body? Can they? I mean, so any food um, which you feel doesn't react well when you, doesn't sit well with you when you eat it can lead to inflammation. I've uh, highlighted sort of lectin um, based foods because those are the main kind of culprits for joint pain, um, you know, but for example, my daughter is intolerant to cranberries. And when she eats them, she's, you know, her skin starts scratching. So, you know, the skin issues like eczema, psoriasis, rashes, they're also a symptom. They're, they're a kind of inflammation, right? They're not maybe necessarily pain, but they're a kind of inflammation. So cranberries, again, I mean, you know, it's a healthy, you know, food, um, you know, why on earth would it cause that? But for her, it's, it's something that she can't eat. So uh, again, like sometimes there are these, uh, as I call them, those love foods that are really great for you and nutrient rich that are supposed to be foods that you can eat, but for whatever reason, they don't sit well with you. And so it's a matter of trying to uh, understand the reasons why and seeing if there are steps that we can take to improve our gut health so that if it is something that we want to have as part of our diet, we can have it. Perfect, two, two more quick questions. Uh, mm -hmm. One is uh, Karen was wondering, can you recommend some plant proteins that are love foods? She's vegan. Oh yeah, um, so plant foods that are vegan. So again, um, beans, if they sit well with you, are love foods. And if you take um, some time to maybe take the steps that I was uh, that I was saying before about soaking them, maybe sprouting them or, you know, using them in sprouted form or cooking them in an instant pot, they can definitely be a, a love food. Um, you know, there are also vegetables with high uh, protein content, like for example, Broccoli is one of those. It has a really high protein content. Hemp seeds are a popular one that I really like to employ, particularly at breakfast time. Two tablespoons of hemp seeds have a, your kind of um, daily protein requirement for the meal. So it's a really rich um, source of uh, complete protein uh, hemp seeds, as well as mushrooms. Mushrooms are a good source of uh, plant-based protein and, um, you know, soy tempeh, any of the fermented um, uh, soy products as well. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. That's great. And the last one from Wanda, should we eat fruit and veg at the same meal, same time? Um, so there, there are a lot of um, different opinions to, to this question. Um, and my opinion personally, because I'm aware that one of the main contributors to inflammation are um, um, when your blood sugar is not regulated properly. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons why um, people have blood sugar regulation issues is because they're eating too frequently. And so they're really activating that insulin response too frequently during the day. Um, and so, you know, um, there are people who say, oh, you should have like fruit on their own. But, you know, what happens is that they use fruit as a snack. And when that happens, then depending on what kind of fruit you're having, um, but generally, you know, fruit is high in fructose, it increases your blood sugar fairly rapidly. And um, what happens then is that insulin comes in to sort of like manage that uh, blood sugar response. So because I discourage eating uh, between meals, not just to improve your digestifier, but to also regulate your blood sugar, 
I uh, encourage people to just have, um, you know, a piece of fruit uh, after their meal as a dessert. That's great. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to move on and say that um, using your data, your blood work data to mitigate your risk for pain is also really important and something that I want to draw attention to because getting regular blood work uh, is really important to monitor your inflammation markers and especially as as we age, and I, I encourage anyone over the age of 40 actually to get blood work done on a regular basis and share this information with your health and wellness practitioners, um, and the practitioners that you work with. I use this information all the time to make targeted recommendations for what clients should be prioritizing in their diet. And I've just given you some examples of um, you know, what to look for in the blood work or what to request. Uh, from your doctor. I really like to look at homocysteine, you know, where your homocysteine levels are, C-reactive protein, what your fasting blood sugar is, your fasting insulin, HbA1c, how your thyroid is working because that impacts your metabolism. Um, vitamin D3 levels are also really important uh, in terms of, you know, supporting your, your immunity and lowering inflammation. And it's really, um, also really quite telling what's going on uh, in terms of inflammation, uh, you know, your cholesterol panel and your liver function um, can give me a, a really good indi indication of, uh, you know, where your inflammation markers are at and how um, food and nutrition can help uh, lower these inflammation markers and get you back to a more sort of, um, you know, level, level stage. So um, it's really important that you keep on top of your, your blood work. Um, and I also use this information um, to, to recommend targeted supplementation um, protocols because you know, I can't stand supplement graveyards. How many of you have like a whole bunch of bottles of supplements at home that you, you know, bought because you heard or read in an article that it was good for you and you started taking it, but you didn't really see any improvement and you're wondering like, oh, is it even worth it? And then you just leave it, right? A lot um, of, of people have supplement graveyards in, in their in their home. And, uh, and you know, one of, one of the things I try to do is to, to really make sure that we don't get into that uh, cycle of just buying supplements that are not good for us. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, we should be getting our nutrients from our food. Our body is designed to recognize food as a nutrient source and not a pill. And so really, if there are any nutrient deficiencies that we need to address in order to lower inflammation in the body and mitigate pain, joint pain, whatever kind of pain you might have, um, the, the key really is to work on that gut health piece and make sure that you are efficiently digesting and absorbing your nutrients and getting those nutrients from your food, prioritizing the love foods to give you all those nutrients and really step away and not prioritize the, the saboteur foods. So that's really, really important. Stay on top of your blood work. Um, make sure that you share it with your practitioners. Make sure that they know how to use this information to develop a program and a protocol that's really going to work for you. That's really uh, super, super important. And it can save you a lot of money on supplements too. For more serious cases, like an autoimmune case, um, like rheumatoid arthritis, you're probably going to need a little bit more careful attention and a little bit more targeted gut healing work. And this is where, um, you know, uh, working with a practitioner can also help. Uh, a lot of, um, in, you know, if there is inflammation in the small intestine or the colon that can cause uh, acute pain crisis, then you really need sort of a targeted gut healing program to, to, to help there. Um, so that's, that's really uh, what I wanted to say is sort of a special thing with uh, more serious cases like rheumatoid arthritis or like an autoimmune condition. Um, and finally, I just wanted to show you some examples of what pain-free love-led nourishment could look like over the course of the day. Um, and as I mentioned towards the beginning of, of our talk, I really like to prioritize three things in my meals. 
I like to make sure that there's a protein there. I like to make sure that there's lots of plant-based foods to give our microbiome that rich diversity of fiber and nutrients to, to help promote a, a healthy microbiome. And I like to make sure that there's lots of healthy fats in there to lower inflammation and to help regulate our hormones. Um, does that mean that I am like a paleo nutritionist or you know uh, some kind of like person that doesn't like carbs? Absolutely not. Carbs are also uh, an important part of the diet. And as I said, it's not about giving foods up, it's about trading up. So but the, what I find is that, you know, nobody needs any encouragement to have uh, carbs be a part of their meal. No one needs help with that. But people do need help um, for ideas and recipes and ways to include more plant based food in their diet. So really, um, you know, these pairs highlight those love led, um, you know, love rich foods, um, because I'm assuming that you uh, can also uh, just add to it, you know, the, the carb portion. So you'll see here for breakfast, for example, you've got some scrambled eggs, you've got some avo mash, you've got, you know, maybe a baked apple, you can add some like um, you know, steamed spinach to that, for example, or whatever kind of other uh, plant-based food that, that you like. If you want to have, um, you know, a couple of slices of sweet potato there, or if you have a, a favorite, you know, piece of bagel that you like to have for breakfast, you can add it. But again, it's about prioritizing those love um, nutrient-rich foods uh, and crowding out the uh, opportunity for the saboteur foods. It's about making sure that you're using each meal as an opportunity to get all the nutrients that you need to support immunity, to support energy, and to really lower inflammation in the body. Um, One last question, Christine, that's come up is how much time ideally should people leave between meals? Um, the ideal time is five hours. So okay. if you have breakfast at like eight in the morning, um, you can eat your lunch at one o'clock and then you can have your dinner at six. With just, is it, can you have like tea and herbal tea and stuff between there? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank as you. long as you don't add sugar to it. Okay. <laughs> that's the little, that's the little trick. So yeah, so lunch can look like, you know, some grilled chicken with a little vegetable stir fry on the side, you know, maybe a slice, um, maybe a slice of rye bread, for example, if you wanted to have like a really nutrient dense, um, rich carb. Um, again, you know, the idea isn't to eliminate all of the grains or eliminate all of the carbs. The idea is to prioritize those nutrient rich foods. And for dinner, you can have some roast salmon, you know, you can add like however many sort of vegetables, different vegetables. I don't want you to have, you know, having tomatoes or sorry, broccoli or something like that three times a day doesn't count. The, the idea is to really get diversity in your meals and to, uh, to use every meal as an opportunity to, to promote a healthy gut microbiome. So diversity is really um, the key there. Um, and as you can see, actually just to sort of, um, address the question of the fruit. I've, you know, I have an example there where you having a, a little bit of blueberries as part of uh, your dessert. And um, I love blueberries. They have amazing superpowers. They are charged full of anthocyanins and those anthocyanins, they help fuel the memory centers in our brain. Um, so if that's not love, I, I don't know what is. Uh, blueberries are a great little love food. Um, so, okay. So I think, Erin, I think we've come to the end of the of the presentation. Um, and I guess at this time, I'd like to thank everybody for their time and, and their attention and their curiosity. And I just, uh, I'm at the ready to field your questions. Well, thank you, Christina. It is uh, 12 o'clock, but we can go a little bit ahead uh, or over if you like. A lot of questions came through um, that we answered. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of nice, some nice feedback coming in. Thank you for the informative webinar and answer to the questions that you were great. Um, so what I'll do is I'm going to send um, an email tomorrow well, from Zoom and um, I will, it will have a copy of the recording um, mm -hmm. and, and we'll also have some information about a, a nutrition program that Christina is running 
uh, in February, uh, as well as some, some uh, fitness stuff that Vintage is running. So you'll get that email tomorrow. Um, thank you so much for your time and your curiosity, as Christina said, and your energy. Um, I did answer a question about what's the green mashed up stuff. Um, I thought that was avocado mash. Is that avocado mash? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think um, it is. I hope it is. That's what I meant it to be. <laughs> and then is is honey sugar? And I said it's better than regular sugar, but it's still a sugar to have in your tea. So yeah, so, is it is right? still considered yeah. a sugar that you're having in your tea. Yeah. Um, but you know, it is a better sugar, especially if you're having raw honey, it's full of antimicrobial, antimicrobial properties. Um, and that's why honey can be such a good thing when you have a cold. Perfect. All right. Listen, thanks so much to everybody. And, uh, I look forward to in six weeks, we're going to do a, another webinar all about heart health. Um, oh, so wonderful. I look forward to seeing you guys soon. And thanks so much, Christina. That was really amazing. Pleasure. Pleasure.